everyone. Raymond Moore, the Kilted Prepper here. How's everybody doing? Man, today we have got a very special guest and someone I actually haven't talked to in quite some time, Fernando Aguirre. Uh, he wrote some incredible books, uh, Survived the Coming uh, Economic Collapse, and he also, his biggest one right now is Street Survival Skills, and this book is incredible. In fact, he actually did all the illustrations himself, so I'm super impressed with this book. I love it, and then he also wrote a book about bugging out, and it's either bugging out in your local area or even bugging out into another country, which I know that's something that he did when he you know, it basically expatted out of Argentina. And so our guest today is Fernando. Fernando, hi, how are you doing, bud? Very well, Ray. Yeah, it's been, it's been a long time since we last talked, but, you know, very nice to be talking with you again. Yep, yep. So what is going on with you? Bring people up to speed. <laughs> and I know you've got a huge Spanish channel versus... Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's something I started kind of well just a, a few years ago, really, with, with the pandemic and all that stuff. I had a, a bit more uh, time around, and I started a, a Spanish channel, and it, it took off. People love it. I have over two hundred and twenty thousand, I think, subscribers over there. Wow. I translated uh, the, my latest book, this one, the Street Survival Skills one. I translated to Spanish, and it's it's been four years now, the best selling survival uh, book in in Spanish. Wow. Um, and it's it's very humbling because for the different you know currency rates, it's a lot more expensive for people to buy this in a place like Argentina or South America in general. You know, if you're somewhere in Europe, you have Amazon that just ships to you next day without any problem, free shipping and all that good stuff. But for people in in Latin America, it is expensive, man. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's no way around it. Printing a book is not exactly cheap. So that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very encouraged by that. So are, are a lot of your Spanish speakers or Spanish viewers in Argentina and in Central, uh, Central and South America, or are they yeah. also in other places like Spain? And Yeah, yeah, it, it's all over. I mean, a lot from the United States. There's a lot of people, you know, as you well know, a lot of mm -hmm. Spanish speakers over there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, many of them know English, of course, as well, but they like reading it in 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 spanish so yes it's mostly latin america spain uh of course those will be the main ones but quite a bit of people that are either expats or people that you know have are fluent in spanish living in us and they buy it as well mexico is another big one uh so yeah very happy with that awesome cool well, that's good that's good to know um Let's talk a little bit here about current events and what's going on yeah. here in America. And I know that you don't live in Argentina anymore. So you're somewhere over in the EU. How is everything affecting what America is doing, affecting yeah. the world and from your point of view? Correct. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, I, you know, I've lived in, in a number of different places and and I actually move around quite a bit. You know, I, I have the, I'm fortunate enough that I can do that. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's something that I've, I've done even when I was a little kid because of, of my, my family, that we moved around quite a bit too. And especially with, with what I do, I get lots of feedback from people from all over the world. You know, a lot of, of course, you know, mostly folks in, in U.S., uh, but uh, across uh, Europe and, of course, Latin America as well. It's, it's very interesting. It's not always the same. And sometimes uh, we, we, we are you know, influenced by our local uh, politics in ways that surprise people. Uh, in terms of the economy, for example, it's not the same everywhere. You know, I'd say that pretty much all of the developed world is doing pretty bad in general. I think that in, from what I know, uh, and you know, I have family, that have, uh, you know, I have my, my brother, he, he's in London and, you know, UK is being hit pretty bad with inflation. It's, it's probably the worst country of the developed world right now. US is, I mean, you can relate to this, but let me know what you think. With inflation in the United States right now, it's pretty bad as well. And it seems to be focusing mostly, it seems to be impacting mostly middle class Yep. And, and poor people, because it's affecting stuff like food prices, energy, gas, these things that don't matter all that much for someone that is very wealthy, you know, the, the rich, let alone the elite don't care all that much if food jumps, you know, twice 
you know, 100% in price, but you know, for a, a family that is already kind of, you know, getting by, you do that and you destroy them. So that's something that I relate to for, um, someone was asking me last night about how similar is what's going on right now in the United States with what happened in Argentina. It is getting uncomfortably close to that. Wow. You know, the, the kind of inflation you guys are seeing, I mean, you know this better than I do. You haven't seen this in, in recent times, right? Mm -hmm. No, nothing since maybe possibly the 2008 mm -hmm. uh, when that happened and everything. But this is now surpassing uh, 2008 standards. Inflation, right. Yeah. yeah. And it's starting to really get troublesome. I mean, the U.S. government say, oh, it's only 8%. No, that's bull crap, <laughs> no. man. It's at least 25%, especially with yeah. food and, and, and gas and energy yeah. and things. The inflation is, is killing people. And it's getting to a point where people are, do I pay my rent? Do I pay yeah. my energy bill? Do I pay for my prescriptions or do I buy food? Yeah. And it's boiling down to these things. And is this the same thing, sort of thing that you saw in Argentina? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it was inflation was, was even worse. It was, you know, you're, you're talking about prices of food, like um, going up 60, 70 and maybe doubling in in a week. Now, one of the things that I learned from that is that they, they lie. They, they cook the books. They, they just, you know, oh, yeah. they just tell you stuff that you visibly can tell it's, it's not true. So as you say, 8% inflation, that is, that is BS. That's not true. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what they do is that they take into, what are you taking into account so as to come up with these numbers? Okay. So we look at bread, you know, food, meat, uh, plane tickets. Oh, wait a minute. I don't fly all that much. You know, maybe an expensive uh, plane ticket is in the budget of someone else. I haven't never even gone out of, of, of the country, which is the, the story of a lot of people. So you, you can't say inflation is not really all that bad because it, 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 plane tickets haven't gone up more than whatever percent it is when you have to focus it on, on, the, on, the, on the different economic groups that you have. But they do this, you know, yeah, the, the prices of, of luxury yachts has not gone up, you know, whoopee, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not something. Luxury loss, yeah. Right. That's not something that's affecting my economy or, or you know, BMW or, or, or Audi vehicles, you know, some of the more expensive cars. Uh, it hasn't gone up all that much. OK, but what about everything else that does impact my my home economy? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, interesting things with with prices soaring and everything, we're starting to see a rise in crime here. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this is where your book, your street survival book is is a really good book. And. What are some tips or some information that uh, you saw in Argentina and how can you share that with people that are starting to see a rise in crime in their area? Yeah, well, you know, about crime, when, when I did my, my, when I started with my Spanish channel, I had the option of translating, you know, I, I wanted to get a book out there fast for people that were asking because I started with a channel and people immediately noticed, you know what, <laughs> you have books in English, you don't have one in Spanish, you know, like, screw you, what, what are you doing, man, come on. <laughs> so I had to make the decision and I translated this one first. Yeah, I translated street survival skills first because I knew that people in Argentina and in Latin America would need that a lot more than my first book because they've already gone through this stuff that I explained in my first book. They, I mean, I'm, you know, preaching to the choir here in terms of, yeah, this is how you survive in Argentina. Yes, I'm here already. <laughs> so the, the stuff that I, I put in, in, in street survival skills is, is not just my experience being in Argentina, but also lots of stuff about learning in classes, you know, and, you know, taking classes that are not exactly cheap. They're expensive. L learning to use these things, you know, it's one thing to shoot like a can or a target. It's another thing to take classes like, you know, defensive shooting classes, advanced, you know, intermediate, an advanced uh, working in groups, moving with our people, how you move inside indoors, room clearing, which is you know something that's really not advised, but still it's mm -hmm. something that there's ways of doing things. Or 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 you know, I took a dedicated class on shooting in and around vehicles. Mm -hmm. you know, that that was the only the, the class was focused on that. So all of those things I, I put it there, and and people really appreciated that because. Uh, with a book, they have somewhat of an idea of, of what you learn in those things without having to spend the kind of money that it invo involves that. 
but you know, sorry for the tangent here, but no, no, go for it. But I guess what I'm getting at here is safety is the main concern mm-hmm. and getting by economically. Yeah, that, that is tough. But even right now, if, if you talk, I was talking with someone from Argentina just days ago and they left, you know, just like I did, they had left and, and you leave because of crime. You leave because it's just too damn dangerous. I mean, you can get by even with horrible inflation, even when, when half the country becomes poor, you can somehow, you know, find a way, survive, scrap, you know, make more money, get by with less. You, you can still stay, especially in a, in a developed country, even more so. But when you get shot, man, when, when, when your son gets killed, when, when you are left on a wheelchair, you know, all things that I, I've known of, of people having that happen to them, then it's too late. Then it's too late to say, yeah, we're leaving. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're moving out of here. Um, and people postpone that and wait and convince themselves, or, oh, we couldn't be better anywhere else. And there's things you can't do. And, and that's what I, what I explain in, in my books and in my videos and all this stuff. Uh, then there's a moment, and this is something I talked with Selko. You, you probably heard yeah. of Selko oh, yeah. from uh, his, uh, his time in, in, in the, you know, during the Bosnia. siege. Yeah. I think he was in Sarajevo or around Sarajevo. the area. Um, so, so he's gone through uh, you know, a, a war in which people were being butchered as well. Uh, and you know, the advice is, and, and even with what you're seeing right now in Ukraine, the advice is don't be there. You know? yeah. I mean, we can talk about the tangent of, uh, okay, I get my family out of here and I come back and fight for my country because it's my patriotic duty, because I'm not giving up my homeland to these bastards or whatnot. But you first get your family out of the mess. You're not fighting a war with your family, with your kids running around the bullets, you know. Yeah. Um, but the, essentially, when it comes down to survival, it's not be where survival is very difficult or even impossible at times. When, when I, I, I mean, and even cities like what Aleppo that was bombed to rubble. Yeah. You don't survive in places like that. You're barely, you know, getting by. And yeah, people just getting out of there is probably the most simple thing now. This does not mean that you just jump ship whenever things start getting tough. Where's the line? Well, the line there is when your quality of life can no longer be sustained, when your basic expectations of, can I really walk down the street without fears of getting stabbed or shot? No, this happens every single day in my neighborhood. Okay, for me, that's a red line. I can't live like that anymore. Even if I have my gun, even if I know how to use it, even, you know, how long can you sustain that? there's going to be a moment where you run out of luck. And even if you do know how to shoot these things and you're good at it, uh, yeah, it's not a movie. Eventually you will get hurt. Your family will get hurt. Someone will suffer the consequences of your decision of staying. So these are not, and this is maybe what I covered in, in bugging out and relocating the most, which is, that's, that's my least uh, popular book because it is so heart wrenching for a lot of people to make that decision. They don't even want to. I mean, I can talk to people about this stuff or my first one, right? But trying to explain people that maybe leaving your country entirely is the decision to make, they don't even want to hear that. And I get it because it's not easy. And millions of people around the world in different countries stay where they are and they're not leaving. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's what it comes down to, I guess. Different topic here. Uh, with, are you seeing possibly hyperinflation start to rise its ugly head here in America? Yeah. Compared I, to Argentina. Yeah. Then, then there's, of course, the differences, right? You're talking about Argentina and you're talking about the United States that still has the option of printing the money that the world uses. So you can't keep on printing insane amount of money. You're still doing the same thing. You're still talking about something that, if it hasn't got the trust of the people, it is still a piece of paper, just, a, just as much as an Argentine peso. Yeah. So that's what freaks out people regarding, you know, an economic collapse kind of scenario, which when people lose trust in that piece of paper, it is the same. It doesn't matter if you're in the United States or in Argentina. When there's no trust in that piece of paper, the entire system collapses in yeah. a matter of hours. You will run to your bank and you will get nothing out of it. And when they allow you to get something out of it, it will be worth nothing, which is what happened to us in Argentina. 
that is still something that I don't see as clearly as, you know, something that, yeah, this will happen. And some people say they do, right? And I don't know what they're making their, their you know, predictions, of, of basing their predictions upon, um, especially if they are like adamant about, yes, the, the US dollar will fully collapse like, by 2023. Okay, could well be. I have no crystal ball here. Mm. I don't see it as strongly as a, a country that does not print the world's currency. I see that the path that those in power, you know, which you know, is a topic for, for yet another conversation, but those running things, they can do, you know, they, they can keep you know, putting money out there while sustaining a, a system by which due to military might and having the back of, you know, the, the Saudis, you know, they, they may be angry, they may complain, but they still play ball. China still plays ball. Europe still plays ball and everyone goes along with it. You can keep on grinding the purchasing power of the poor and the middle class until they don't realize it up until the point where they look around and they think, damn, we are now Argentina and the economy hasn't collapsed, but I'm living like an Argentine. I'm poor as hell. I'm surrounded by crime. And what's the difference? I mean, do I even have a better life quality in Argentina today compared to some cities in the United States? It depends. Depends on where you are. Just like in the case of the United States, if you're in a small community in the United States, you have a better life than someone in Baltimore that is getting attacked by a, a, a peaceful protester like we, we saw recently. And I just yeah. uploaded a video about that. Uh, a guy in Argentina living in a small community probably has a better lifestyle. Mm-hmm. probably lives in a safer place he may he for sure has access to better medical care that is more affordable within his budget than a guy in the united states no doubt whatsoever mm-hmm. if you are middle class in argentina middle class and if you're lower middle class or even poor you have better access to medical care in argentina than in the united states oh but we have the best medical care in the planet everything yeah but you cannot afford it Yep. <laughs> this is like saying, oh, but my neighbor has a Lamborghini. Well, good for him. But what what do you have? Oh, no, my, my car, I, I cannot even afford the fuel for it. I, yeah. I can't pay the gas for it. Okay, so what, what the hell? What gives? Your neighbor has a Lamborghini. What do you have? What mm-hmm. can you drive? So uh, a celebrity has access to the best medical care on the planet? Yeah, of course, in the United States or anywhere else. But you, what kind of access to proper medical care or acceptable medical care do you have? Oh, I have nothing. I'm screwed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then let's talk about that. Not what someone else can afford. And and these are things that slowly corrode your standards of living. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you care about putting food on the table, being safe, you know, getting treatment if you need it and enjoying life as much as you can while you still have it. Right. So what would you do, because uh, in, in your book, uh, Surviving the Economic Collapse, um, what would you tell people to start, I guess, collecting or buying or getting on hand to survive some sort of uh, situation? I mean, again, here in America, our, our prices are going up yeah. like crazy. And, and it's not to the point where it doubles every week, mm-hmm. but uh, we're looking at global fertilizer shortages. Yeah. We're looking at fuel shortages. I mean, no matter what the politicians never yeah. do, this stuff is coming down the pipe no matter yeah. what. And there's nothing that can stop it. And Correct. so what are some suggestions that you would tell people to do mm-hmm. living through what happened with you in Argentina and everything? And how could how could they acquire or get or or do uh, certain things so that they have better odds for them and their family? Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's a it's a good question, and you know, it's it, it's for, at least for me, it's been a process. I don't just take in a, in account what what I went through in Argentina, which yeah, that was my, my starting point. But but since then, one of the things I remember the most is uh, my conversation with. Daniel, which is a prepper in Venezuela. And he told me something once that stuck with me. He, he bought, when, when, he, when he saw socialism take over Venezuela, mm-hmm. uh, he, you know, he had, a, a, he had a, his own business, you know, a security thing going on. He had a, uh, you could say a comfortable middle class. He wasn't rich. He wasn't struggling, lower middle class. He was a, a comfortable middle class, his own business kind of, you know, living in a nice area and all that, mm-hmm. all that nice stuff. 
which I think a lot of Americans can probably relate to, you know, or somewhat, you know, somewhat yeah. close yeah. to that. And he told me that the first thing he did when, when he saw the you know, socialism take over is he went and bought two years of food. Yeah. Two years, not six months, no, two years of food. And talking with him 20 years after that, he told me it's not enough. You know, two years of food is not enough, which is something that surprised a lot of people. Even when Mormons say, get a, get a year worth of food, is it? Mm -hmm. you think they, they yeah. go away with that? Yeah, sure. A year is good. I mean, a, a month worth of food is good. Whatever amount of, of food you have, my point here is no matter how much food you stock up, it's not going to be enough. So get as much as you can right now. Yeah. Prices will not go down. They will only go up. Yeah. So stuff like um, dry pasta, which is a, a, a cheap staple, stock up on that. You know, put it in, you get yourself one of these um, vacuum sealers in, in the plastic bag. You can go with barrels, but you can stock these things up like you stack them like bricks. Yeah. You know, get yourself, you know, 300 bucks of dry pasta, the cheapest one you can get. Stock it like bricks in some place that's away from, you know, bugs and rats and whatnot use some common sense there. Um, and if you want to go with, with barrels, with rice, yeah, sure, do that as well. But pasta is easy. It's something that most kids and people digest well, not much of a problem with that. And it is food. This is like buying kibble for humans. Pasta is like that. Um, and I mean, there's people that have lived on that for years. Uh -huh. You can supplement that with some vitamins, um, Daniel told me that one of the things he missed the most was like canned meat, you know, like protein. Mm -hmm. So the uh, canned tuna, the thing is that's going to be expensive. So ration it accordingly, you know, have a good balance of staying alive with, you know, you know, pasta will keep you alive for years, eating that alone almost. And with anything maybe that you grow yourself or purchase or buy locally or trade with someone, you know, I have a pack of pasta, you have some, you know, eggs or greens or whatnot. You, you will water and trade after, yeah because you know what a, a, a hen with, with a, a few eggs that that's nice but if i have to feed a, a family for a day a pack of of dry pasta will do that a lot better than a than a handful of eggs if you don't want to kill the chicken so yeah, that's that's something that's going to be acceptable for some people so if you have a good supply of that and pasta store probably does not go bad yeah. the taste the grace but i mean it, it lasts for a very long time that would be one of the first things. And then be smart with your expenses. You know, when, when, when you start spending money, uh, you don't have a, which is not what most people in the United States uh, need to be told, you know, buy yourself a gun. This is the kind of thing that in other countries I, I have, I have to tell people, yes, go get yourself like, oh, but I have to get my papers. Usually it's not that complicated. It's like getting, you know, some, you know, fill in some paperwork and get it done. But there's not the same gun culture as in the United States in our places. Uh, and again, one of the things that impacts the most is the price. A, a, a Glock in a place like Argentina, it's going for $1,000. Mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're not getting a used $300 Glock in, in Argentina. I, I don't think you're getting one in the United States, even these days, giving prices. Um, ammunition is not cheap. So all of these things. But yes, something to defend yourself. Don't buy a, a hundred guns. If you have a couple guns, you're probably more than <laughs> you then settle on, on that aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, make any important expenses that you have to do. If you need to change the car, do it now. If you need to buy anything that is critical for you, do it now, but be careful on what you spend. And then yes, precious metals, gold, silver. If there's something that you need to buy right now, spend the money on that before getting it into precious metals, because that's useful. That's something that you need. It's stuff that you need to replace or fix around the house that will be to be need to be changed soon take care of that as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now you're mentioning precious metals and such. Um, in your book, you were talking about buying junk jewelry. Yeah. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that and why, why, yeah. why buy that? Yeah. Well, you saw a lot of people selling these, you know, that your yeah. gold wedding ring, you saw a lot of people just going and <laughs> I need to put food on the table and selling that. So the thing about uh, a gold and silver, especially with gold, you, you're likely to get ripped off if you go and sell anything. You know, in the middle of a of an economic collapse, you go with a you know a a, a gold eagle, man. I, I, and there's exceptions if you go to certain brokers that are you know in the downtown area that they you know trade on on you know, commodities and uh, and only accept themselves like bullion. You know, 
and that sort of thing. Yeah, you're gonna be getting a, a closer. It's like selling online right now, or or selling in a in a in an actual dealer. But if you go to a pawn shop, you're gonna you're gonna you're, you'll get destroyed. So my advice is instead of waiting for that, see if you can buy very close to spot junk gold and silver right now. Maybe not junk silver. Oh, but yeah, when you have when you talk about junk silver, you're talking about pre sixty five coins and that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. So. You, you, and that's a, another good option. I have a bunch of junk silver as well, coins from different countries. I like collecting them as well. So there's something to that. Um, but yes, um, the, the thing is that when, when you have a, a full blown collapse, you're a lot more likely to end up um, selling at a, at a loss if you paid for a higher premium with bullion and your uh, gold eagle, you would have wished to buy that same am amount of, of gold, like. The, the, the weight of the actual metal as close to spot as you can, or even lower. I mean, I know a guy that he just set up his website, I buy gold, and he was buying it just a little bit under premium. And he that's how he built up his stack of junk gold. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. So when you're out and about and you want to, did you do a lot of barter and trading and, and everything like that in Argentina? No, no. I mean, it, it got very close to that for me. I mean, Things were tough for everyone, and, I, and it wasn't an exception for me. But fortunately, I I, I had enough resources to to get by whenever I needed. Um, there's little things that I did sell that you could think yeah, was it bartering? I, I for example, you know, this is stuff that people don't even think about. So I guess it's a one of those little pearls of wisdom. You know, I, I sold my Xbox, <laughs> and, and you would be thinking, oh, that is so stupid. You know, think about it in terms of preppers and survivalists. How many survivalists have you heard saying, stack up a bunch of Xboxes? <laughs> they took that Xbox out of my hand. I, I couldn't have sold gold as fast as my Xbox back okay. in the day. And that Xbox that I, I made, it was, I, I bought an alarm system that I very much needed with that Xbox. Mm -hmm. you no, know? so I, I traded something that was, you know, luxury item in the middle of a, of a collapsed economy, there's people that still want to get stuff for their kids. There's people that still want to have a good time. One of the things that I, I wrote in you know, the early days, even before my book was, get yourself a good TV. You're going to be spending a lot of time indoors. Mm. You're going to be spending a lot of time finding cheap entertainment because you cannot afford anything else. And it's even d d dangerous for you to go out there. Mm -hmm. So all of these things, you're stuck home. Think about you know, soldiers, you know, American troops in the Middle East, what is it that they're doing all day long? Shooting zombies? No. They're playing freaking Xbox as much as they can when they're not getting shot at. And the, get, the getting shot at aspect is what? 1% of the time spent? So you have to think about all the downtime that you have. This is going to be you in an economic collapse as well. Uh, good TV, Xbox, lots of movies downloaded for when there's no internet anymore. You know, and a, a solar panels has to keep some of these gadgets going. Uh, yeah, that's that's part of it as well. But when it comes down to really changing something of value for me, for someone else, I mean, a Glock I could have sold for good money as well. And I did. Um, when I was leaving Argentina, one of the things that we sold for the best money, toys. Wow. So we had people pay for them more than we paid when we first bought them. Mm. And they took those out of our hands. They couldn't buy them quickly enough. So think about what I'm saying. In a collapsed economy with 50% poverty rate or more, you know, it's like 20% of people below the poverty line with this, uh, people that are just out of the system entirely. Those people, the thing that they wanted the most, and with a gun, you have to go through, you know, the, you know, the, the, the paperwork of finding someone that has a, the, the gun license to buy it go through all the process, it's nowhere near as easy as selling uh, an Xbox and a bunch of old toys. When we left, my wife sold most of the toys our kids had. You know, we were not going to be dragging around the world a bunch of you know, four suitcases full, full of toys. Um, she sold them. Uh, uh, some of them she sold for more money wow. than, than, than we bought them for. And people could not thank us enough for them. Wow. We were not even trying to scalp anyone. We were just trying to get rid of them. But when we saw the prices, we, we thought, damn. I mean, and they bought it. One, one woman bought like most of what we were selling. She, she was super thankful. Uh, and people kept on asking about it for, you know, after it was sold. So yeah, 
you know, interesting things that you, you don't think that much about. But when you analyze it, the psychology of it and, and people struggling, you want to keep your kids happy. And all of that stuff that is now more expensive, I'll rather buy a used one. My kid will be just as happy. And my kid matters as much. You know, I, first of all, I want to put food for him on the table and selling used food or selling food when you're not a store and you don't have the, you know, the, the basic standards that are required for most businesses that sell food. That's kind of, yeah, you can do that. You can sell food locally and you can barter and all that stuff. But the, something that is not a food is likely to fly quicker out of your hands. Interesting. Interesting. So stock up on toys and stock <laughs> and up on Xboxes. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, use common sense, right? You're, you're probably not going to do that, but uh, there's nothing wrong with having a good TV and a, a, and a console. Yep. I, I have three kids. Do I like them playing video games all day long? Of course not. I don't let them do that. You know, no, mm -hmm. you can only play a little bit during weekends after you do real kid stuff, which is go to school, you know, study, uh, do sports every single day for my kids. They, they are you know, swimming or doing judo or, or Brazilian jiu-jitsu or something. Mm -hmm. And yeah, on weekends, yeah. And I play myself. I, I play video games too. I'm not ashamed of admitting that right away. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I play <laughs> World of Warcraft from time to time. <laughs> so yeah i get it yeah yeah it's um, you mentioned your kids uh what are you doing how, are you teaching your kids a preparedness lifestyle yeah i i probably don't do it in the way that many people think and you know someone told me i have to write a parenting book which <laughs> <laughs> no I, I i have three kids my my oldest one is 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 20 years old now and he's he's doing very well great, doing very good for himself fortunately and my, my youngest one is four years old. So I have, wow. I have a spectrum there. And my, the one in the middle, a teenager going, going through teenager uh, things. Uh, I, I, I try to stay very chill, relaxed. And, you know, there's certain things that uh, there's, there's certain lines, you know, there's certain lines that you, you know, you, you have, to, you have to do well in school. It's easy enough. Even a, even a kid that is not half as bright as you are. I know how smart my kids are. And, you know, don't drag your ass, do what you have to do and go get acceptable grace. I don't expect much, but I do expect at least that. Uh, and then what I do is try to talk with them, you know, talk with your, a lot of people don't even talk with their kids. It's so easy to just find activities, do stuff, do this. And you, and a lot of people homeschool. I, yeah. I get the homeschooling thing. And for some people it works. Uh, I know people that have, Gone, done very good with homeschooling. I know some people that haven't done good at all with homeschooling and, mm -hmm. and they regret it. And they, they don't, or even worse, they don't regret it and the results are bad because they, they just didn't know how to do that. And they're not teachers themselves and they haven't had you know, uh, uh, the education that would allow them to be teachers. If you don't know your, you cannot teach what you don't even know yourself. So for a lot of people, let's be honest, as much as you would like to homeschool, can you do that? <laughs> do you have that kind of education yourself? Have you ever taught anyone? You know, I, I taught for a while in university. It's not the same as, as teaching kids, but it's not easy. Um, what I do is supplement what they're being taught in school with uh, my parenting. I'm not a math teacher. I'm a parent. So my kids understand many of the ways of the world. You know, none of my kids are commies. They're not in any risk of, of being that, even though they've had some of the most horrible commie teachers you could think of. In fact, one of the teachers I'm, I'm most grateful of is a downright communist teacher that one of my kids had. He was so obnoxious about it that he achieved what I couldn't have achieved myself with endless speeches of the dangers of communism. He was like, dear God, if I have to take one more hour of this man's class, I'll kill myself. It's unbearable. <laughs> so if you, you don't have to be a teacher. You have to be a parent. Yep. If you're a parent, your kid will figure out things for himself, no yep. matter what kind of lunatic he has in front of a class. Of course, you have to be very careful with very little kids because these days, especially in the United States, the United States is the worst I've ever seen. I haven't seen any country that is doing the kind of things that Americans are doing to their children right now. 
It's it is not allowed anywhere. There's uh-huh. even laws being passed. You cannot drug a kid into trying to change his sex. Are yeah. you crazy? And people, you will not see much of it, but there's going to be a little article about uh, Finland banned transgender therapy for children. Whoa, whoopee do so racism of them, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of idiotic thing that you, you see, but that is very dangerous right now. If you just leave a, a, a little child in the hands of some of these people that, I mean, they should be getting treatment themselves. They shouldn't oh, yeah. be treating anyone or, or being you know, handling little children. So that is something to be careful of. You uh-huh. just don't leave your child with just anyone. Yeah, no, having sex, yes. No, some of the things like I do with my my little girl is I'm teaching her how to cut up vegetables and stuff yeah. and we dehydrate. Uh, nice. She loved planting in the garden this year and she had her own little garden and yeah. uh, we'd go out there and pick veggies and everything. And in fact, mm-hmm. it was just this l- couple of weeks ago, we ate our last big zucchini from garden and you know when they grow it and they do it yeah it's like oh wow tear into it man this is good <laughs> you know eat your greens you know so many parents have problems getting the kids eat their veggies yeah have them grow a garden and the kids are going to chomp down on it but uh, that's awesome loves doing gardening she loves working with me in the kitchen i'm teaching her how to cook and everything like that nice and so i'm trying to teach my child to be more independent if if you yeah. want to say that and think on her own and and stuff so those what, what are your plans for late are you planning on, on doing homeschooling or we don't know yet or... um there's some interesting things going on here in virginia mm-hmm. we just got an email actually talking about teaching our on our she's in first grade start yeah. teaching them about sex ed mm-hmm. and it's like no, you're not going <laughs> to my kid about that at this age. Yeah, What's yeah, wrong yeah. with you? And <laughs> um, and so a lot of parents are actually upset that mm. that they're trying to push this in the school system here. And mm. so hopefully more parents will sit up and you know start speaking up and everything. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Like what you were saying. Yeah. What about one of the things I've heard is like like a bunch of parents organizing and having maybe, you know, if you get enough of them, maybe have your own little school thing going, maybe get yeah, a charter it's like a charter school. Yeah, they talk right. about those charter schools and, and everything. Um, I mean, we are fortunate of where we are, where we are. We mm-hmm. actually have good schools, good teachers and yeah. everything like that. But it's still a lot yeah, of this yeah. stuff is slowly seeping in, even mm-hmm. even in our area. We live yeah. in rather conservative area and and stuff but yeah. it's it is it is crazy because the the government is coming after our kids yeah and and parents are this this last election a lot of uh people was running for school boards all over the u.s and because mm-hmm. parents are basically sick and tired of it yeah and then also um in fact i know uh, a, a gentleman just ran for the um um city congress or city council and uh wanting change and and everything like that so we're seeing a lot of the grassroots coming about and and taking charge and everything and so it'll be interesting to see what happens and stuff at least the local level people are getting involved and stuff and Mm -hmm. that's good to see so but the elections are still up in the air and there's still a lot of concern and yeah you know uh i i I think i pray to god that i mean we lost the senate we republicans Mm. conservatives um lost the senate but also uh how close is the house really i think we've gained the house but still it's it's kind of crazy and everything out there yeah stuff so gold and you're looking at a very complicated political moment throughout the world in different parts it's you know, in, I think it's it's insane what, what you have going on in, in, in U.S. right now with, with a man that did so bad with the economy, with everything. And, and they, they still couldn't capitalize on that. You know, yeah, just, you have to make some you know, self-criticism of maybe maybe something was wrong. Maybe maybe we screwed up in, in presenting, you know, options for people that, you know, if, if you see this man that is incapable of, of having a, a, a basic conversation with anyone. He's talking with people that have honestly died. He's yep. not well. Yep. So you, you can't solidly beat that guy. Why? Yeah. Um, yep. There's something to be you know, uh, self-critical about and say, 
we have to change something. We we can't mm-hmm. we can't keep on. And and I know that a lot of people focus on all the you know the questionable things. Listen, this happens in elections everywhere. And the more of a of a third world country you're talking about, the more fraud and you know shady stuff going on you have. But at the end of the day, and same as, as it happened in, in, in Brazil. You know, Brazil would be a place where no doubt there's, you know, shady, tricky, you know, you yeah. know what I'm talking about, things going on. Yep. Um, still, Bolsonaro did win back in the day. He did win. And now he did lose. Whatever shady thing went on, he's... But one of the things that people from Brazil tell me is, man, there's a lot of people that, would, that did not want him anymore. Yeah. So how, how did you screw? And, and yes, there's going to be people, oh no, they stole our entire, yes, yes, they, yes. But at the same time, if it's overwhelming, the support you have from, for one guy, they can only go too far because if not, you have violence on the street. Yeah. It, when it's overwhelmed, the case of uh, Meloni in, in Italy, that woman, uh, Meloni, that, that one, she's, she's a, as conservative as they, the media is saying that she's a, a fascist, that she's Mussolini. The woman still won. Yeah. The woman is still prime minister of, 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 the, of the country right now. So yeah. you know, they can cry all they want, but, uh, and they can call her a fascist all they want. She still got enough votes. Whatever trickery was going on there, they couldn't pull it off because of the support she had. So what I want to end up here with is, is get off your ass and go and vote. Yeah. How many people stayed and didn't, couldn't be yeah. bothered? Uh, I mean, you probably hear this all the time. Oh, I don't even bother because it's all rigged. You know how it's all rigged by you not even going. Yep. That is the biggest, you know, it's like the devil convincing you he doesn't exist. So you're convinced of you being useless with your vote. So you don't even vote. Guess who's going out and voting? Yeah, yeah that's, the other. that's uh, here's, here's a good question mm-hmm. is you being over there and seeing what's happening in America, how do you foresee what's happening in our elections, possibly affecting you, affecting the world, but also affecting the people here in the United States? Yeah, I think it's going to be having more of an impact on 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 U.S. rather than because one of the things we, we can all, I think, pretty much agree on is that what, whatever ends up happening, uh, the, the establishment always wins in terms of they, they always end up getting away with. There, um, you know, in, in terms of foreign policy, I don't think it's going to be much of a change either way. Um, you know, we, they, they may bark uh, saying our things, but at the end of the day, it's all about money, right? So you, you don't you don't mess with the money. Now, the thing I would probably be more concerned about if I was an American is what we were talking about before: how this impacts our, our schools, our kids, what they're being exposed to or not, uh, how much you you have to make a adjustments and plans for um, protecting yourself and your kids from, from their agenda, which is very evil in some cases. Yep. I totally agree. Um, Kind of switching lanes here, war in Ukraine. So a lot of people are very concerned about that. Mm -hmm. I watch other prepper channels and they're talking a lot about it and everything. Um, From your opinion, uh, how is the war in Ukraine faring and what are some of the issues that you're seeing or what yeah. are some of the concerns that you're seeing? Well, that's one of the things that would be very unique uh, to the uh, United States. In the rest of the world, pretty much everyone agrees that, you know, it, it was a, a, a invasion of a Russian authoritarian invading his neighbor and going for a, a full-on land grab, you know, whatever um, uh, politics that they had. And it, it used to be the case that they had their man, you know, just like in the case of Belarusia, Bielor, uh, which is, you know, a president that is still under the satellite of Putin basically working for him, which is, a, which is kind of messed up. If, if you have a country that is supposed to be a sovereign nation, how the hell do you have a, a president that is doing the bidding of someone else yeah. rather than your own people. So that was already, well, that was the situation they had until they kicked away the, 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 the Putin's man. And when all of this really started, which was back, back in 2014, if I remember right. Mm-hmm. Um, and even then there was, a, you know, uh, an, and the entire world looked the other way because one of the, I, I, yet again, one of the things that, you guys in the United States don't, for example, the World Cup, the FIFA, you know, the, the football yeah. or soccer yeah. World Cup, 
it is huge all over the world, except in the United States. In the United States, no one gives a damn. The entire planet is watching that thing. And in 2018, it was done in, in Russia. Mm-hmm. So four years after the initial invasion, there was a whitewashing of the public image of Putin and Russia with the World Cup. The World Cup is always one of the most corrupt uh, settings you can think of because it's always used as a way of whitewashing the the politics of any given country. Mm -hmm. There's massive fortunes that change hands so as to win uh, a World Cup. Mm -hmm. You're hosting, you know, China, Qatar this year is going to be Qatar. All of these countries that need a, a fresh new image. So no, we are not horrible people that run terrible dictatorships. No, we're friendly soccer players. So <laughs> uh, there's a lot of money that you, you wouldn't believe how much money is involved in all of these things. Uh, but it was done in Russia, and no one, no one seemed to care that he had invaded and attacked a, a neighboring nation in Europe. Mm-hmm. It only got to the uh, unsustainable point when when he went just straight for Kiev, you know, I'm taking over the capital. And well, as we all know how that played out, but in, in the case of the United States, there's not a, a a united coercive idea of, yeah, we don't stand with communism. We don't stand with, with dictators. There's always this state of, well, Ukraine is also corrupt. So, well, we shouldn't be involved in the politics of other countries. Well, uh, there's always that thing from the right. Usually you see this from the left. It's always countries like Venezuela, Cuba, China, Argentina with their left-wing politicians. It's always the left wing that supports Putin and Russia because they have this this common interest of a Soviet uh, left-leaning way of running things. But in the case of the United States, you have a lot of people in the right that think, well, you know, Ukraine is corrupt, or this was always part of Russia in the 1500s, or mm-hmm. all of these. I didn't, or we do. One of the one of my favorite ones is we are horrible as well. You know, it's, <laughs> it's something. It's something to see an American saying we are worse than Russia because we invaded Middle East. Okay, yeah, I I, I agree. That's that's bad. I mean, I have friends that uh, uh, participated in, in wars in the Middle East. As, as a, a good friend of mine, Marine uh, Force Recon, he was there and he said, I understand why you're shooting at us. I would shoot us at us as well because we're invading their country. Yep. Whatever excuse you, you want to make, we're invading them. So of course they're shooting us. I would be shooting at us as well. And he was there and he did what he had to do as, as, as a soldier. And I get it. And he gets it as well. But it is interesting that now, if it's Putin that is, that's invading, well, Putin is fighting Satan and Nazis. Okay, you know, it's, it's kind of very hard. But one of the, I want to do a video about it, Tulsi Gabbard. Tulsi Gabbard is a diehard socialist. She's, she was a Democrat until last week. Now she's the darling of conservatives because she shoots an AR and she's a, a veteran a veteran that speaks against the military actions that she was directly involved in and participating of the invasions that she speaks against. And now you're supposed to be on Russia's side during an invasion of... Anyway, it seems mad. And it's only in the United States where you see this. And people that go to other countries, they are surprised by not finding a, you know, um, you know, um, a, a common a, a philosophy or idea of how this is supposed to play out. Now, in terms of how the war is going, it's going terrible for Russia. Mm-hmm. And they were doing, and this is something I, I talked about in, in, in my podcast uh, back in the day when, when this first started, we were talking about how this was a horrible mistake from day one. Yeah. I mean, he had already taken like part of the, the, the world was looking away when he took part of the Eastern border, uh, which was already bad because you're invading. I mean, no American would give an inch of his own country. You wouldn't be okay with Russia getting back Alaska because it was once theirs. Mm-hmm. You, know, you wouldn't. No American would say, "Yeah, let's give them Alaska. We we bought it from them from peanuts, and it was really theirs to begin with. So let's surrender Alaska to Russia." Right? 
No, no American would ever say that. No Ukrainian says that either. There's not a single Ukrainian that believes that they should give away their. Of course, you have people that are, uh, you know, uh, Russians living in Ukraine that have uh, have that idea, sure. But it, it's very, very much united. The idea will not give them an inch. That's what they're saying. And as of right now, why should they when they're winning? They're yeah. actually winning right now. They're yep. ki- they they repelled the main attack to Kiev. That is undeniable. The idea was to take over the country in a, in a week. They thought they would take over the country in a week. That was what Putin had in mind. He went straight for Kiev, and then all of a sudden, it started falling apart because the guy Zelensky didn't, didn't fly away as expected. He was supposed to leave, replace the regime, and that would have been the end of it. Everyone is happy. There's maybe a civil war, you know, civil war going on in, in Ukraine, and America takes sides, and Russia takes sides, and, well, no one is invading here anymore. This is a, a, a Ukrainians fighting Ukrainians, which is something that the United States is always comfortable with. When 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 the when, when the American military goes into a country, there's usually because they're on one side or the other of an ongoing conflict of some sort. Now this it fell apart because the guy did not leave. It pretty much the entire country rallied around him, and they repelled the Russians in that initial attack. And now you're going for. Uh, a retreat in in the largest uh, in the key city that they had taken and declared Russian like a month ago, and now they they already left. So it's going well for them. Why on earth would they compromise on anything? And um, last point regarding this: Could they even compromise with Russia that has not uphold any agreement they ever had on anything? And if there's one thing they're known for is invading countries and taking them over. I mean. Ukraine has people from Georgia fighting for them. The, the, the Chechens that are not siding with Russia, they're fighting against Russia themselves in Ukraine. So they have a lot of support. Um, in the case of the elections, it could have been that with a stronger Republican election, that it could have been maybe a little bit less support, but that's missing with money. And as we said, you don't mess with money. That's a business. Yep. You don't mess with the American economy, which runs on military expense. Yep. So even with a Republican red wave, I don't think it would have changed. Now, of course, even less so. Um, but- what, do you think, what do you think about the nuclear issue? Do you think uh, you know, mm. people need to be preparing for something like yeah. that? I mean, I, mean, I can yeah. honestly see mm. Putin using some small tactical nuke, you know, some yeah. 0.03 megaton yeah. to wipe out a power plant or an airport or I mean, something small and everything. Yeah. And so, I mean, and if that happens, I think the whole world go crazy and, and everything. Yeah, like that. that's one of the biggest fears that a lot of people have and realistically so. Now, one thing that people seem to be forgetting, the United States hit with a drone, the Ministry of Defense of Iran mm-hmm. in his own country, in his own land. You had a military action against a key you know, military asset in the country. Iran has military, has, has nukes. Mm-hmm. No one was worried about Iran nuking U.S. Why not? Yeah. I mean, that was, that, was, that was one of the first, and I, and I was talking with, I don't, rem- don't want to put words in, 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 in other people's mouths if I cannot remember exactly what was being said. But I, I remember having a conversation and, or, or maybe it was online, maybe it was in a, in a forum chatting, so it could have been a written reply that, uh, that I, I said, why, why did you kill the guy? And it was because he's very bad. And I came, okay, there's a lot of awful people, but why against Iran directly? You're, you're hitting you know, a, a, mili- a, a military um, you know, high-ranking officer in their own country. Uh, why is it that you have such a, such a grudge against Iran? I mean, yes, we, know all, we all know that Iran, but... If you look online, many people that actually visited Iran, like tourists and such, they, they I mean, yes, it is a Muslim nation with everything involved. Now, the United States has no problem doing business with other Muslim nations that are a lot brutal themselves. So the Muslim thing and how much we agree or disagree ourselves as Christians or whatever it is that each one of us is, uh, you may disagree with the culture and the religion itself. Uh, 
but in that case, you're not worried about a, a nuclear response from a nuclear country and you feel okay with shredding to pieces a guy with a drone that threw swords at him in his own balcony, which, it, yeah, it's very cool. But at the end of the day, it's still military action against a nuclear power. Now, you're looking at Russia. Russia has more nukes than everyone. We, we all know that. Uh, the thing is, if you have 10 nukes, that's more than enough to yeah. cause a lot of pain to anyone but they have five thousand. First of all we have to see how much really they have because in theory they had two million uniforms and they don't even have those so how many of those are still operable how much they actually have when they obviously lack so much um you know they, they have weapons of course yes but their military has proven to be substandard yeah, yeah. Let's put it that way. yeah. it is it is humiliating the way in which they're shown running away right yeah. now and they're making because i try to stay you know, well informed on both sides of course you have propaganda on one side you have propaganda on the other yep. now yeah I, I sympathize a lot more with the propaganda of you know the, the female sniper the female ukrainian sniper uh, let, let's go girl power yes yes sure that, that's all part of the propaganda uh, i'm a, a little bit more uh, forgiving with that given everything going on um but there's no question that they, they've suffered a, a huge uh, setback in the eyes, just like it happened to the United States when they declared victory by leaving Afghanistan after 20 years. Was Yeah, we declared victory. That's why we're running away and we're being chased, uh, uh, hit on our tails as we run. Okay, mm -hmm. sure. They, let's call that a victory, I guess. Uh, and, and we do a drone strike on a guy that was carrying bottles of water just so as we have the, the cherry on top of this total mess and let's leave the taliban better armed than ever before as we win yeah. <laughs> okay um maybe that was one of the things that russia saw as weakness and yeah. maybe now we can you know, we can be the police of the world and do russian things in other countries uh, but about a nuclear war well there's a, a basic uh, logic that has to apply here we, we always have to go back to that if i'm a die hard Kami myself, and I'm advising Putin, the first thing I would tell him is, look, if we can't beat Ukraine, we can't fight the entire world. So mm -hmm. the idea of having a World War III, that's something that should not even cross your head as you're taking a leak in the toilet. You <laughs> can't beat Ukraine. You're not fighting United States and Europe at the same time. They would destroy you. They would destroy us in, a, in less than a week. They would bomb the crap out of everything we have. And if we start throwing nukes at one another, yeah, we can do a lot of harm, but we will lose. There's nothing for us to win here. Mm -hmm. So starting a, thir a third world war, which is like people like Tulsi Gabbard, which are, you know, I don't know. I don't know who's getting paid. I don't know the, the, the true beliefs regarding socialism that some people may or may not have. I have no doubt that people are bought, especially when you're took it, looking at, at, you know, when you're looking at, at leading conservative figures that all of a sudden are fanboys of Vladimir Putin, I mean, why? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are, aren't you American? Why are you saying that America is, is the devil and Putin is the savior of the galaxy? It doesn't make any sense. Anyway, that's, that would be one of the first things to keep in mind. No, uh, a third world war is not something that Russia has any interest in starting because they can beat Ukraine. Yep. In the shape that they are in, they, they are losing support even from their own people. Yep. If, if Russia, if Putin had 80% support at some point, which I do not doubt that he had at some point, mm -hmm. he, hasn't that, he hasn't got that anymore. Mm -hmm. That is beyond questioning. If you see all of the footage that is available from Russia, people are like, well, we don't even want to touch this with a 10-foot with a pole. It was a horrible mistake. This is a terrible idea. Now, can he use a nuke in Ukraine just to... Show them that we are strong. The bear is still ah, roaring. Same thing. It has been said many times that if they have any kind of nuclear action in Europe, in Ukraine, then you're escalating things where NATO will consider that a, an attack on the entire region and you have to be stopped immediately. Would they actually do that? Would they do that if they just drop one of these dirty bomb things? You know, a dirty nuclear bomb is the point with a, a dirty nuclear bomb, which is different from a tactical bomb is yeah. it's not going to be doing you any good. So what is it? You, you drop it in what Kiev and piss people off even more. They're not surrendering. 
they're not giving up. They've already killed how many Ukrainians, how many Russians have died already. Mm -hmm. These people are fed up and they will die fighting the Russians. That's pretty much said. And if the United States can't beat Afghanistan, if Russia couldn't beat the Afghans themselves, because sometimes people forget that, yeah. and, and Afghanis are not Ukrainians, They're, Ukrainians are tough as nails, and yeah, Afghanis are, are tough as well, but Ukrainians are much better trained, and they have all the West supporting them. This will not end up well for Russia in any way, shape, mm -hmm. or form. All he can do is extend the pain for his own people and for the poor people in Ukraine. I don't see any other way of this ending rather than then accepting that this will not go their way, maybe try to get uh, Crimea, maybe that, if that. <laughs> but why would I even give them that if they're kicking them off their entire land? Many Ukrainians, I mean, it's not many, all Ukrainians say, we'll get them out of, out of every inch because we cannot trust them. They, they screwed us over when, when we gave them our nuclear weapons. That was an agreement that both the United States and, and Russia and Ukraine had. It was the three parties that they, 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 this is not like, oh, NATO expansion, that there's no agreement of any kind about that. It's just verbal. Oh yeah, we said we wouldn't expand, but we do expect. Look how it's going in terms of NATO. NATO has two new countries and it's stronger than ever. When, when Trump was saying that there was no purpose for NATO, who doubts it now? Yeah. Who wants to get off NATO now? No, yeah. you just got two new powerful countries. No, not, not, you know, borderline. No, you got, what is it, Switzerland? No, Sweden yeah. and Sweden and Finland. Yeah. You got two serious countries added to NATO. And they couldn't go to NATO's door fast enough, giving everything that they were seeing. Maybe that was in the cards as well. Who knows? Uh, but as of right now, uh, yeah, this, uh, this is going... Uh, very poorly for Russia, to say the least. They can do a lot of damage and they can kill a bunch of people still. They're still doing a lot of, of horrible things. And But at, at the front lines, they're getting pushed back. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. Are you doing anything personally to possibly prepare for a European war? Yeah, you know, there's... Uh, there's certain things it's in some countries they have given away, but it was even before that. If you look at uh, in Switzerland, in Sweden, I keep saying Switzerland, in Sweden, uh, even before the invasion, just when they first invaded in 2014, they, they gave away uh, a little survival manual to all citizens that, you know, preparing for war with Russia. This was Switch Sweden, uh, you know, in 2014 already. Um, I don't think Russia wants to even get close to a war with Europe or NATO. I don't think mm. there's any chance of that happening. It would be beyond stupid. It's not even suicide. It's, it's just completely illogic to start a war with, uh, with NATO because starting a war with uh, Europe is starting a war with NATO. Starting a war with NATO when you're getting your ass kicked by, uh, by Ukraine is not in the cards. Could there be an explosion of some rogue, rogue elements of some kind, some Russia, crazy Russian that is replacing Putin, and it's even crazy. If someone replaces Putin right now, it would be someone that is not on the line of Putin. It has to be someone that has the support of the people. You will not have the support of the Russians by going even more crazy and stupid than Putin did already. Mm -hmm. That's, again, not how it rolls. That's not how it goes. If you force people in this impossible position, anyone that's replacing him will have to come and you know, have a, a mature discussion and say, yeah, that was unfortunate. We'll go back to doing our thing. And the damage to Russia is already there. They're already a pariah for anyone rather than a very small amount of, 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 of countries. I mean, the, the territories they annexed, not even their allies uh, um, recognized that themselves. Even their own allies didn't recognize the territory that Russia annexed. Mm -hmm. So it, anyway, yeah. But yes, it, it, the, the, um, is iodine tablets, uh, some basic preparedness. A lot of basic preparedness applies to a, a, a nuclear conflict as well. And sometimes people think that just a, a bomb, a nuclear bomb going off, it's the end of the world. No, it's not. You have to have you know a, a certain amount of of attacks. There's been, one of the things I always look in terms of preparedness is, has this ever happened before? 
Mm -hmm. And if you look at war using nuclear bombs, it has happened before. The survivors of, of the attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki that are still around, yep. burned very bad, but very much alive. Yep. So people have survived it, even ver being very close to the actual explosion. That would be very close to what a tactical nuclear explosion would be like. It's just mm -hmm. around the 10 megaton, is it, give or yep. take? So that's something that, yes, with proper planning, you have a chance of surviving. How worried am I about a nuclear war uh, with Russia? Zero. How likely is it that they would use them in, well, not, you can never say zero. You know, there's always like that 0 0.1 or 1%. Uh, how uh, likely is it for someone in Ukraine? I would be a lot more worried if I'm in Ukraine than if you're in pretty much anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, but you can still survive a, a nuclear, a, a tactical nuclear explosion if you're not right in the, in, 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 in within the immediate range, you can move away. You have wind. There's that's yet another thing that Russia has going against it, which is they're so close to Ukraine that even if they do use a, a tactical nuke, this is probably why he doesn't even consider doing that. Wind. I've, I've been checking the, the wind pattern for the last few months. Mm -hmm. It's always pointing towards Russia. Sometimes <laughs> Kiev is pointing directly at Moscow. So there's been days in which a, a nuclear detonation in Kiev would end up in, in nuclear fallout in Moscow within 24 hours. Yeah. What kind of lunatic would do that? Yeah. You, you cannot risk that. You cannot risk wind changing and dropping fallout on my own country. Mm -hmm. So that's probably why he doesn't even consider doing that. Yeah. But, you know, very, you know, volatile situation and we have to all be very careful of all of that. Yeah. Okay. Switching, <laughs> switching lanes here. Weapons. You, I, I see you're, you're playing with your magazine here. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> and here in the desk. Yeah. Uh, you, you showed some, some weapon there that you have uh, with a flashlight on it. What is it? Talk. Yeah. Let's talk. Well, yeah, what? this would be my carry. Glock 17 would be my my, mm -hmm. my choice. I, I try to not, not practice. I, I try to compete, you know, every once in a while. I, I had a, a competition recently and uh, shooting IPSC uh, uh, didn't do well at all. And that just says a lot about how much I need to, to practice more because it is it is definitely a, a perishable skill. If you're not uh, practicing, you know, I think that once a month, it would be the, the minimum, you know, once a month just to keep uh, a certain uh, skill with it. Um, I mean, you could even go with less than that. If you look at police training, they do what? A couple of times a year, uh, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less, but around those numbers. But yeah, I, I try to stay on top of that. I'm grabbing some of my weapons here to you know, <laughs> do some show and tell here. Um, and I can't find my tie light. I had uh, my one of my favorite knives to carry is the cold steel tie light and yeah. it's the extra large. I like big, long knives. Uh, well, yeah. I actually designed a pretty long knife myself. Oh, this is, cool. This is this is my knife made by let me see if I get that close enough. It's made by Aitor, uh -huh. which is Aitor is, a, you know, people that are into knives, they probably know of it. But Aitor makes has made some still make some of the more you know, famous survival knives like the Jungle King. You probably saw it a bunch of times. Uh, Jungle King 1 and 2. Uh, those would be some of the, the better known survival knives. And I actually got in touch with them and they ended up making up my, my design, which is this one. So uh, oh, full cool. tank. It's, it's a pretty decent uh, knife. This would be my ideal survival knife. Uh, mm -hmm. It's N680 currently, the production. It, it was... A, uh, a choice of a, a tough, very tough stainless steel that still holds a, an edge better than, you know, stuff like 1095. It is expensive. It's not exactly, but it's still going for like, I, I think it's $180 in their website. That's so it's not, still, bad. It's yeah, not bad at all. Yeah. Made in Spain. You're not talking about some China made crap. So it's made in Spain by Aitor, which is a uh, famous um, survival knife manufacturer. They actually test the, the Rockwell hardness there. Mm -hmm. so they, they, they test. Wow. Yeah, they do a little bit of a, a test. And there it says, I, I thought fair fell over there. And it, it even comes with, with a sheath that I'm very happy with. It's uh, the same sheath they use for the Jungle King. And it has a small survival kit. So awesome. uh, um, uh, a ferro steel, you know, a fire steel 
And yep. it even has a little uh, Skinner knife. So you have oh, a, wow. a second knife. I think it's actually a pretty good deal. Yeah, you know, it's it's what I did. So it has um, a, a stone, a sharpening stone there as well, a little bit of cordage. So I think it's a pretty cool setup for anyone that wants a, you know, a quality uh, survival knife. Mm -hmm. Much better than, you know, a lot of this stuff that goes for almost as much in mm -hmm. the market. And it's your basic carbon steel, nothing. This is not, you know, this is a boiler Austrian steel, which is quality stuff. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'm super happy with it. So that's why I, <laughs> I find myself talking about it. My my latest purchase is I used to have a Glock 26, and I was I've been looking around. What do I you know get a Glock 26 again? Until I uh, talked to some of my viewers and everything, and a big a, a, a lot of people kept coming back to getting a Canic uh, TP Elite. Yeah. And it, this basically it's a Glock 26 or it's a Glock 26 architecture. But mm -hmm. the thing I like about it is that it has uh, a plate here yeah. so that you can put a red dot. The red dot, yeah. And, and yeah, things. Nice. And then uh, the, the magazines are not a 10 round, but a 12 mm -hmm. round. And then uh, the other magazine, yeah, I think it's 15 or 16. Yeah, 15, 15 round nice. magazine and, and everything. But it even comes with a cool little Kydex, you know, cool, yeah. uh, uh, holster and everything. But uh, I love this thing and yeah. uh, it's just, it's very feature rich. And uh, I, I think it's, I think it's a, a, a great, mm -hmm. you know, this is my carrying conceal. And then yeah. like you, I have a 19 with a TLR one also mm -hmm. on it and everything. And that's my, my home defense weapon. Nice. And then yeah. uh, one of my other pocket swords that I like is <laughs> this Luzon by, by Cold yeah. Steel. And I, I love these big long pocket swords because you can you can you know choke yeah, a up, lot of range yes. or or mm -hmm. come down on it and give you that distance and, yeah. and things. But uh, cold steel I love because they're inexpensive mm -hmm. and you know and they're still a decent knife for for yes it, it's one of the brands they have the most knives yeah. of uh, yeah especially the earlier ones some of the ones made in Japan that were. Um, you know, they, they later, uh, even today, they still have quality manufacturing, even though you know, some of it made in Taiwan and China. But, you know, as long as it's made well, uh, but Cold Steel is probably one of the best value uh, brands you have. They have good designs, good locking mechanisms, one of the strongest. That triad lock is no joke. It's, it's, it's really an improvement and it's very strong. So I like sometimes the you know, fancier stuff like ZT, which is more expensive, but Really, it's more about you know having nice something that's nice looking and well yeah, and 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 pretty designs rather than oh purely functional. Uh, Cold steel makes maybe some of the best uh, knives for the money. Completely agree there. Uh, do you have any blades or anything like that in your home inventory for home defense or? Uh... Well, I have way too many knives all <laughs> over the house. I mean, this is just. This is just one. Of, I mean, I, I definitely like knives. So I have a number of them. I, I usually go with the ZT or the, the Cold Steel Voyager. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, um, the, yeah, the, the Vaquero series I like, yeah. uh, especially the recurve one. But uh, Voyager is maybe one of the, the series that I like the most from, from Cold Steel. Usually, if not, it's, uh, I'm using now a, a CRKT. Mm -hmm. It has like a, a flipper. So the, the CR, CRKT, I like a lot that I got recently, but usually it's going to be something like that in my pocket and a, a Leatherman in my pocket all the yeah. times. So. Yeah. Going back to the knife that you designed, why did you just uh, choose that sort of style? Why uh, something kind of like a Kukri store? Yeah. Why, why a recurve? Well, yeah, the idea was, uh, I think that recurve is a little bit um, harder to sharpen, but in my experience, uh, having a, a, a heavier head like this, it really aids in the chopping ability of the. So this is the idea is to have something that is still short enough. I think it's like 17 centimeters long. So it's, you know, kind of like you, you have a sweet spot of what, like a, like a K bar is, you know, yeah. like a mm -hmm. that seven inches or so, or so is big enough to do what you need it to do, yet not too big that you're not carrying it and not small enough that it's like a, one of these bushcraft knives, you know, that's mm -hmm. just a, a little sharp knife, which is okay. But for me, survival is about having this sharpened pry bar that will cut. But if I need to pry with this thing, I mean, in, in the testing I've done for, uh, for the production of this knife, I, I, I cut through a piece of wall with wow. a knife. 
and still just you know passing it a little bit like that, it was shaving again. Um, that's because of the steel that is used. That's because of the geometry of the blade. It's, it's pretty you know thick stock, so it's not the sharpest. You know, if you go with a um, a puco style of grind, that's gonna be sharper, but you're not gonna be cutting through a a, a brick mm -hmm. and then you know shaving with it almost right away. Um, but it, it is true that if it's purely for cutting, if you go with a very narrow angle, it will cut more for you know it will do maybe like uh, 600 cuts of, of cardboard. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go with a more steep angle, it's not going to be stronger in terms of cutting for more more time. It's actually going to be cutting less, mm -hmm. but it is going to be stronger in the amount of damage the blade will take before it starts chipping and breaking away on the edge. A good steel helps. A good heat treatment helps as well. But there's a lot to the geometry too. Well, something about the your blade there is that it's kind of got that S curve. Yeah, so it's got a it's got that deep deep valley yeah. and then a the big belly. Head. And and mm. something that I always talk about is in a blade that sort of style, mm. it'll it'll deliver a deep cut because that yeah. that valley hooks in. And then exactly. you pull that across and you're going to get a big, deep cut from that yeah. belly. Like it would be like the same physics, like with a carom bit, you know, something that works yeah. like a hook, whatever gets caught in here is forced against the edge as you pull away, as you cut. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be giving me a heavier head for chopping. It's slicing nicely because of what we just said. It just catches material. And one of the things that I wanted specifically for my knife that I haven't really seen any in any other knife is this part right here. So many, very often you will see a choil here. Yeah. I don't like choils. I think that choils are stealing from my knife, <laughs> uh, a, a part of the real estate that I want in, in edge. So usually the choil means it's easier to sharpen. It's easier for the manufacturing guy to finish off that edge nice and nice and clean because the Spanish notch has something to do with that, but especially the American bigger notch things that, oh, I put my finger there. No, no, no. I, I don't need that. I'll put my finger right there close to the edge, but I want this thing to cut to the very end. Mm -hmm. And when I'm putting like in this position and doing like shavings, what I do here is I have my hand very close to the end where, mm -hmm. the, where the, start, the blade starts. So I can push down on this and do very nice shavings with that edge, with this sharp edge, that's not gonna be in contact with the chopping stuff or the slicing stuff. So you have this for some nice detailed cuttings. So I, I have all of this in a, in a nice continuous curve and not some of the knives that we've seen, like the, the tracker, for example. It's not a knife I like with, that, with like angles changing. Yeah, no. I think that a knife, a knife should have a, a straight edge. Yeah. You know, when you have like a, a straight edge, it is a little bit easier to sharpen at least in my experience, for my ability, I sharp either one just as, as fast and as well using a, a ceramic rod. Yeah. I just pass it a couple of times and I get it that someone that doesn't know how to sharpen a knife will have a bit of a harder time learning with this, with, mm -hmm. with this curvature here. Um, you can still sharpen it. And what will happen to someone that is not using like a, a rod uh, he will probably end up having more of a steep angle mm -hmm. uh, around here. And this is going to be it's still going to cut. It's still yeah. going to be a sharp knife. Uh, ideally, you would use this with a, with a small stone, maybe something like what you have there, or even better, a, a ceramic rod. Yeah. Uh, with a ceramic rod or a, a Victorinox sharpening pen, you just pass it a couple of times. And yeah. Anyway, this is what you, I thought of. Uh, do you have any jimping on the back of your knife? Just a little bit. I don't like okay. aggressive jimping because uh -huh. I think it's it's too much. So just a little bit. So as we have a little bit of, 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 of traction there. Yeah. Um, if, sometimes I see it overdone, like jimping all over the thing, you know, jimping everywhere <laughs> you know, is, is, is jimping mark for everyone. No, just, just I said, just, just a little, and it's even just cut, you know, yeah. not too deep. So just a little bit, you don't need a lot. It's yeah. it, the weight of the knife will do most of it. So just put mm -hmm. your thumb in there, push down and you'll get those shavings. What do you recommend? You know, so here's a new prepper and everything, or here's a new person who wants to defend their home and everything. What's uh, what's some weapons that you like for home defense yeah. or personal personal security? Yeah, we, you know, for, for any new prepper right now that is maybe disencouraged of, oh, there's so much to do and it's so overwhelming. I have to buy this. I have to buy Fernando's knives and his books <laughs> and guns. No, you don't have, you don't need to buy anything. If the first thing you should be doing is 
sitting down, calmly thinking about what really impacts your quality of life and your survivability. It's not going to be zombies. It's definitely not going to be Russians. It's going to be a heart attack because you're just having too much of a sedentary lifestyle. So you want to be a, a survivalist for real, a prepper, look after yourself first. Have, mm -hmm. be, be healthy mentally. Try to avoid stress, which is so common these days. So relax, breathe, enjoy life while you still have it. It's short enough as it is. Take care of your body. Some of these Instagram models that so people, so many people like to hate on, you know, like, oh, look at the that that you know the the hot twenty year old girl that she. Well, she's actually doing a lot of money and she's probably very healthy. And the guy doing the same thing. I mean, <laughs> dude, well done. You're happy. You're healthy. You're in good shape. You already have you know pretty much most of what most preppers are actually missing. So do a little bit of that eat healthier, work out a little bit more. No one is pretending here to be an athlete or anything, but there's always something that we could do better. I mean, I have a pretty healthy diet, mostly thanks to my wife. That is, you know, <laughs> a lot, a lot better for all of that. I, 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 you know, I go for the junk stuff more often, uh, but that's, that, that is key, you know, healthy family. Um, it all starts here and it goes through here and it ends up here. Um, and then, yeah, buy the food, buy a gun, learn how to shoot it. Uh, stay on top of things, make plans, have plans for your know, contingencies. That's usually a lot, a lot more to that. A guy in Ukraine that needs to escape because of the freaking Russians, he better have a plan and, and act upon it when necessary. I've done videos even before, days before the invasion in, in Kiev, people were preparing suitcases. You know, they had a suitcase, like, like a go bag. There, were, there wasn't any gun in there. There wasn't a thousand rounds of ammunition. It was clothes, money, documents and little else those people that moved away probably started over elsewhere and as, as bad as that is it's not as bad as getting bombed by the freaking russians yep. so th that could be you in the united states with a natural disaster with a you know a social uprising in some of the inner cities that go out and get out of control ronnie king style or worse you know ronnie king in 2023 and yep. um, so all of these things do help a lot don't focus so much on buying a ton of stuff. Yes, of course, my books, I, I feel very strongly about them because I wrote them <laughs> myself and I think they, they, they help people quite a bit. And, and people tell me that, you know, that just makes my day when I get a message on, on, on Instagram or in, on, in YouTube. It's very often for, for the, the Spanish crowd and Spanish channel that, oh, thank you so much. It, it really is humbling because I know how expensive it is for them. So that besides spending... You know, it would be the equivalent of an American spending a hundred bucks to buy my book. They would be insulting me all day long if I put that price. They mm -hmm. wouldn't be thanking me. But uh, people in Latin America thank me for it. You know why they do that? Because they're going through it and they need it. How You would not believe how many times people that got my Spanish book tell me, dude, I was robbed. This happened. I remember what you said in a video. I remember what I read in your book. It saved my life. Thank you. I've already lost count of that. It happened with my, Eng with my books in English I get as well, but it was not as common. Mm -hmm. in, in Latin America is a tougher place in general. So people put all of this to use more often. So anything else that you want to share? No, man, I think we covered a lot of stuff. I think it went very well, right? Mm -hmm. Anything else that you can think of that? No. Do me a favor and tell me how people can get hold of you. Uh, sure. Talk about your YouTube channel. Talk about your books and how, where yeah. you get the books. You have my YouTube channel is The Modern Survivalist, uh, Supervivencia Moderna for people in Spanish, but The Modern Survivalist for my English channel. I have on Instagram as well that I some every once in a while upload something. And yeah, the books would be these three Bugging Out and Relocating, Surviving the Economic Collapse, and Street Survival Skills. Mm -hmm. the, the three ones that I have so far and more stuff down the pipeline yeah. for eventually. Well, I want to recommend <laughs> your street survival skills. That is a great thanks. book. That's an incredible Thank you. Book. Thanks. Much appreciated. And I, and I love all your little, little, <laughs> and you drew all those yourself. Yeah. I mean, I, I studied architecture actually, and, and I taught architecture representation, which is a lot of sketching and drawing. So, you know, some people didn't like my drawings, but I think that uh, nine out of 10, more like 95 out of 100 did like it. Yeah. The idea is to transmit something. So, for example, if, if I want people to remember something, maybe I, I do a little cartoonish kind of, uh, of, of doodle, right? Something. Mm -hmm. And if I need to explain something like more, more technical, you know, like uh, 
when, when talking about uh, hand placement, you know, when, when mm -hmm. drawing, uh, then like drawing a gun, I mean, then that is requiring a little bit more, uh, more of a, of a, of a detailed, you know, schematic of, you know, mm -hmm. careful mm -hmm. finger placement. And this is the best way, way I could possibly do it. it. Words do not transmit the same as, you know, it goes like that. Basically, yep. place your finger in that way. That's how I was taught. That's how I do it. And uh, living in different countries and taking classes in different countries, that's how good instructors teach all over the world. In the United States, Europe, Latin America, these basics uh, apply everywhere. And those are the foundation of, of your uh, skills to use these things when it matters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So YouTube channel, books, uh, is your mm -hmm. books available on Amazon? I'm in, in Amazon, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Anywhere else or anything? No, ju just Amazon. I know that Amazon is, you know, people, but that's just, that's the thing with these companies. Um, it's, you know, they, they, they have both sides. I, I wouldn't be able to do, let, let me be honest. I wouldn't be able to do anything of what I've been doing if it wasn't for Amazon. Yep. As much of a, of a creepy <laughs> ownership going on, that's also something. And I know that a lot of people, you know, have done the same. same here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I self-publish exactly. also, so yeah. yeah. Uh, your 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 uh, brick and mortar publisher that's been around for a hundred. Yeah, yeah. So uh, websites. Do you have a website or anything? Uh, I have the Modern Survivalist uh, website, but I mostly stick to YouTube these days. It's uh -huh. uh, where most people go. Okay. Well, folks, want to thank you so much for joining in. I want to really thank Fernando for taking this time and sharing with us some really great in-depth insight and information. And so what's the best way of contacting you on your YouTube channel? Yeah, through the YouTube channel in the description, you have ways of reaching me through through there. Okay, cool. So contact uh, Fernando if you have any questions. Furfall is a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, bud. So, thank folks, you. We'll see you. Goodbye, God bless, and kill time. Oh.